This episode of New Politics was released on the 19th of March, 2022, and produced on the land of the Wangal people. Welcome to New Politics. In this episode, Anthony Albanese appears on 60 Minutes. Are we too tough on our politicians? We speak to Saha Kalili from the New Fusion Party. And all the political news of the week. I'm Eddie Djokovic, editor of New Politics. I'm David Lewis. I actually chose the thug life. And a big thank you to our new Patreon subscribers. Thanks for signing up. And if you'd like to support New Politics, you can support us through a Patreon subscription. It's just $5 per month for the Ruby Standard Supporter level or $10 per month for the Gold Standard Supporter level. But whether it's a subscription or if you just want to listen in, read our material online or buy a t-shirt or buy a book, it's all available at newpolitics.com.au and all of this is a good way to support independent journalism. A few weeks ago, Scott Morrison appeared on Nine's flagship current affairs program, 60 Minutes, and it was Anthony Albanese's turn last Sunday night, but it had nowhere near the same promotion as Scott Morrison's. Morrison even appeared in the advertising graphics of this episode, and it's almost like the media wants to achieve its self-fulfilling prophecy of who is Anthony Albanese by continuing to make him as invisible as possible. 60 Minutes did have its heyday in the 1980s, but today it's more of an infotainment format than anything else. Not so many people watch it, but the people that do need to be converted into thinking Albanese and Labor will be safe to vote for at the next election. 60 Minutes wasn't as enthusiastic as they were with Scott Morrison, but Albanese has to appear on these types of programs to different groups of people. And it's hard to say whether Nine Media was trying to do a hit job on Albanese or whether it was just a facile, glossy promotion. But I was disappointed that Albanese didn't do any DJing on the program, but it probably would have been good for him to bring out a ukulele and play a few Radio Birdman songs. They did it so they... They want to be seen as a relatively respectable news outlet. So in the interests of balance, in an election campaign, more or less, the election hasn't been called yet, but in an election campaign, uh, they'd want to be seen as being fair and, and giving at least equal airtime to the leader of the opposition. Now, if you put in the promotions they had and everything, maybe it wasn't equal airtime, but they can't be accused of being totally one-sided. I think... Two, they wanted it to be a chance to promote Albanese in a way that maybe is a bit negative in terms of that, oh, we don't know who he is. So they didn't get into the family life as much. Now, of course, I'm all in favour of less families in campaigns, the better. I think private lives are private lives. Also, Anthony was divorced a couple of years back. None of that is any of our business. It really doesn't tell you very much about people because plenty of other family men, and I don't need to mention their names, have been shown to not really hold those values very strongly. So again, what are his policies is more important than who he is. Well, it's probably a case of Anthony Albanese just being presented as less scary and inoffensive, and that's probably enough to get him to the next election. There were many people, including us, calling for Albanese to become more forthright in promoting what Labor would like to do in government. And I don't mean releasing policy, because that's usually a big killer for opposition parties, but just giving us an idea or a flavour of what a Labor government would look like if they actually form government, and holding the government to account more diligently, because they certainly had a lot of material to work with. But I guess this is the time that the electorate starts to focus on the election, given that it's less than two months away now. But in most elections, it's not people who take a strong interest in politics that decide election outcomes. It's the people who have a casual glance and pay a little bit of attention, not too much, but just a little bit. 
And these are the people who Anthony Albanese needs to appeal to. He did say in that 60 Minutes episode that he suspects that the election will be held on the 14th of May. Not that it's up to him to decide, but it's more than likely going to be held on either May the 14th or May the 21st. And there hasn't been any change in opinion polls. It's still 55% to Labor and 45% to the Liberal National Coalition. There's no change except Albanese and Morrison are level pegging in the preferred Prime Minister ranking, and we don't think this metric actually means that much. It's useful, but ultimately not that meaningful. The media keeps pushing out the message that Albanese is unknown, and they keep pushing out that message, who is Anthony Albanese? But if you've got someone who is supposedly unknown, level pegging with the actual Prime Minister, it means that either Albanese is not as unknown as the media wants the public to believe, and even if he was, to have someone who is unknown to be preferred as the Prime Minister, it says a lot about how poorly Scott Morrison is performing. I think it's fair to say that Scott Morrison has not shone in this election campaign. Again, I'm not 100% committed to thinking that Labor is going to win because the last three or four coalition election campaigns have been appalling and yet they still won. And I know that many of our listeners who are Labor voters remember the heartbreaking disappointment of the 2019 election. It becomes one of those things where a good campaign isn't enough and a bad campaign from the other side isn't enough. And it's the external things. And Scott Morrison hasn't been able to manage the external things. The floods, his mismanagement of that, uh, I think his mismanagement of the virus. I think now too that Prices are going up. Petrol's at pushing $2.50 a litre in the city. So that suggests that it's pushing $3 or even over $3 in the country. I haven't been out for a few weeks. I haven't seen the prices. Even though the Prime Minister can only control some of that, the government of the day generally gets the blame. They can lower the levy on it or the, the tax on it. And I think, too, that Morrison just doesn't come across as terribly authentic, I guess is the term. And in the world that we're in at the moment, we actually need authentic leaders. And this is, I think, the whole, we don't know who Anthony Albanese is, is coming from. With Bill Shorten, they could put the mantra of, oh, there's just something about him we don't trust. Whether that was justified or not is a whole other issue. But that resonated. Whether the we don't know who Anthony Albanese is will resonate in the same way it remains to be seen. Well, the new angle of attack is the appearance of Anthony Albanese and the makeover that he's had over the past 12 months. Now, politicians usually change their appearances or try to make themselves more presentable to the public. And why wouldn't they? You're not going to get elected if you're too scruffy, untidy or look a little bit dishevelled. John Howard used to trim his eyebrows. He dyed his hair, capped his teeth, and he went on to become Prime Minister. Now, I'm not suggesting that just because you trim your eyebrows, dye your hair or cap your teeth, you automatically go on to become Prime Minister. But a lot of people might think that all of this sort of little stuff shouldn't really matter, but it does. What you want to do as a politician and what you want to do as a Prime Minister or a potential Prime Minister is remove as many obstacles as possible, either the conscious ones or the subconscious elements, so that when it comes to election day, people don't think, oh, I don't like their hair or I don't like their glasses or their tight suits, whatever it might be, so I'm not going to vote for them or that person or that Prime Minister or that person to become Prime Minister. But it's another factor as well. It shows that there's an attention to detail and it shows that someone is determined to become Prime Minister. Bob Hawke, back in 1980 when he first entered Parliament, he decided that if he wanted to become Prime Minister he'd have to give up alcohol. And Albanese has decided that if he wants to become Prime Minister, he has to give up Italian cakes. But whether he gives up Italian cakes or not, or decides to have a makeover or not, Scott Morrison has decided that he's going to go for the personal attacks. But not everyone is happy about this. Here's Chris O'Keefe and Carl Stefanovic from Nine Media discussing Morrison's tactics. Let's talk about the election. It's just weeks away. This was Scott Morrison on Sky News last night. I'm not pretending to be anyone else. We're still wearing the same glasses. And, um, <laughs> sadly, the same suits. Um, and, I, <laughs> and I weigh about the same. And I don't mind a bit of Italian cake either. Um, so I'm happy in my own skin. I'm not pretending to be anyone else. 
All right, the Prime Minister clearly watching 60 Minutes on Sunday night. Um, Chris, you? I think it's a, that was a bit of a low go from the Prime Minister. That's a bit schoolyard stuff, isn't it? Pointing at someone's appearance and having a go at someone's appearance. You know, Albo's lost 14 kilos because yeah, he went on a health kick. Good luck to him. Mm. It's got, that's called discipline. Isn't that what you want from a Prime Minister? It's hard to lose weight. I'd love to lose 14 kilos. But losing that and the makeover, good luck to him. Le- Are we really going to have a crack at someone's appearance? I think it's, a, it's, it's well beneath the Prime Minister of Australia. If Scott Morris wants to have a go at Albo, how about we ask what the hell is he going to do for us as Australians if we vote for him? Because I've still got no idea. Well, look, it's, it's certainly going to be interesting um, as soon as the election's called. You can see what they're going to go at. The coalition's completely... Yeah, but Australia, Australians won't cop that. Yeah, I agree. Australians won't cop. That's bullying. Morrison is obviously a bully, and I don't think he knows any better, but I don't think that approach is going to work if he starts to try and bully Anthony Albanese in public. And the other thing Scott Morrison did say is that he's not pretending to be somebody else. But when I last checked, he's pretended to be a sheep shearer, a hair beautician, a racing car driver, a carpenter a bar dancer, gnocchi maker, chef, court sweeper, ukulele musician, a pilot. Now, if you want to go and do all of those things, well, just go out and do them. Stop pretending to be all of those things. Stop pretending to be a prime minister and let someone else do the job who can actually do it. For a man who claims to be a PR expert and for a man who claims to know how to connect with the people, he really doesn't do that great a job at it. Again, the only poll that counts is the election. These tactics that he's attempted might be working at a very subconscious level and might push just enough people to keep their vote or even change their vote at the last minute. It's hard to see how, but we can't know what everyone is thinking at all times. Well, I guess it does get back to those performative aspects of political campaigning as well. And I referred to that section of the community that just takes a passing interest in politics they don't really care that much about and you're probably right there like all of these events we get annoyed about it. a lot of people do get annoyed about these sort of pretend events of being the sheep shearer beautician all of those things that i won't repeat again that obviously appeals to a section of the community that swings elections and and you're right that's probably what all of this is targeted towards and we know that he has an obsessive grip on the message and that he will once he's settled on an idea, he will hold on to it, believing it to be right, till it's not right. Now, he's been a bit smarter in recent times in that if an idea isn't working, he dumps it quickly and moves to the next one. And they, they throw out little nibbles of the next campaign thing in the hope that this is the one that'll grab. Not much has stayed out there, which is really interesting. And of course, the other thing we are kind of not talking about is his response within the community, which seems to be very negative. And even the uh, more supportive media outlets, or more supportive of a liberal government, are showing this up. And all of this has been leading into discussions behind the scenes about what to do about the the so-called Morrison problem. This is within the Liberal Party, of course. Now, we have to take into account that even at the best of times, there are different groups or different factions within any political party who will hypothesise about different scenarios and all the what-ifs. And the theory here is that Peter Dutton and Josh Frydenberg are angling to take over the leadership of the Liberal Party before the election, which means that one of them would become the Prime Minister. But you'd have to think about what their motivations would be in this situation. Is it to save their own seats from a likely defeat or is it to save seats for the Liberal Party or is it to save the government itself? And we also have to accept that any leader in an election, whether that be Scott Morrison or Dutton or Frydenberg or anyone else, will always have a chance of winning the election. Over the past two elections in 2016 and 2019 the coalition has been behind in the polls and they've been fairly mediocre during those parliamentary terms and you alluded to this before David but they managed to change the leadership of the party and just fall across the line when it mattered the most on election day so I can imagine that they'd be looking at this model changing the leadership which then ends up resulting in an election win it gives the impression that the government has changed also so why vote in another change of leadership in Albanese and Labor. So that's probably what the thinking would be. But the problem is that there is a 66% threshold 
for a leadership change within the Liberal Party. So you can imagine that if Scott Morrison cotton on to the idea of a leadership challenge or a spill of the leadership positions, he'd call the election as soon as possible to avoid a Liberal Party vote. But even if there was a challenge, this would create a great deal of instability within the Liberal Party two months before an election. But Dutton and Frydenberg would also be thinking, well, hang on, we've been an unstable government since 2013 and we still got voted back in in two elections, in 2016 and 2019. What difference will a little bit more instability make to us? So let's go for it. If the rumours are true that Dutton and... And they, they come out every few days. Dutton's got the numbers. Frydenberg's got the numbers. Spill imminent. If it's true that Dutton and Frydenberg are both angling for the leadership this close to a federal election, I think there's a couple of things at play if it's happening. One is that the leader of the party, of the major parties, always get between 3 and 5% extra in the votes because people like having the, the leader in charge. It means that maybe they're being better represented and that there's less hoops to jump through to get those improvements and maintenance things that they hope for as people in the local divisions. Frydenberg's polling is apparently appalling. The last one I saw had him coming in third or fourth in the seat of Kuyong, which has been pro-liberal since 1922. And the other thing with Kuyong is that Menzies, Peacock, Latham all held the seat of Kuyong. And Frydenberg as treasurer can join that list, but that hasn't cut through for him. Monique Ryan is a very strong independent candidate. And Kuyong tends to be a liberal as opposed to conservative seat. Still a conservative seat, but Menzies was a liberal. Peacock was a liberal. Petro Giorgio was a liberal. Frydenberg is on the other side. He's a neoliberal. He's on the right of the party. And he's not really one of them. And an educated and electorally smart electorate like Kuyong, I think, would dump the sitting Liberal member for a member that's more in line with their values and beliefs. Dutton's a slightly different thing. He is being challenged by Ali France in Labour, who's another outstanding candidate. And Dutton is loathed around the country in a way that Frydenberg isn't. Frydenberg isn't terribly liked, but if you were stuck on a plane next to Frydenberg, you'd probably get a decent conversation out of him, provided you kept off certain topics. Whereas Dutton doesn't come across like that. Now, I'll I'll be fair, he may be very much the loveliest, nicest guy you'd ever meet outside of politics, but he doesn't come across like that. So he's got the problem. With Frydenberg, he'll probably not save his seat, even with the 3 or 4% jump. Dutton might save his seat but lose the election anyway. You'd need a Bob Hawke type figure to take over the party at this stage. And I just don't see anyone who'd be a credible leader of the Liberal Party being able to do that. We're into a miracle situation now. It's Lazarus with a heart transplant, a brain transplant, lung transplant and uh, being rescued from a car accident all at once. I don't think the leadership challenge is going to happen. But while the rumours keep going, it shows the disarray in the Liberal Party, which goes back to the management of the Liberal Party, including the leadership, which includes Scott Morrison. Well, whether it does end up being Scott Morrison, Peter Dutton or Josh Frydenberg in the leadership of the Liberal Party or as the Prime Minister, no government has ever come back from this current position in opinion polling and gone on to win the election. Now, we can have all of those discussions about, well, what is the value of opinion polls and and those sort of issues, but these are the only statistics that we've really got. And we can go back 30, 40 years to compare this data. But governments, when they're in trouble, they always try and look for announcements or ways to change the dynamics or the discussion about what's happening within the electorate. And there is a budget coming up in two weeks' time. And not that budgets have provided governments with too much of a bounce in recent years, and it's something that the media tends to be more interested than the general public, but it does offer the government an opportunity to springboard into other big announcements. And you referred to the petrol excise that the government has had for many, many years. And One option for the federal government at the budget announcement in two weeks' time is to 
play around with the petrol excise. And you mentioned the number before. I think it's between $0.44 cents and $0.47 cents per litre. But reducing it, cutting it completely, or a temporary reduction probably won't make that much difference. Petrol, as you mentioned, is probably around two fifty a litre in the cities, up around $3 in the regional areas. And if people are used to paying that amount... That's what the petrol companies will eventually push it back up to. And then the government would be losing all of that revenue anyway. So essentially, it would be a profit boost for petrol companies if the petrol excise is tampered with or removed. But if Scott Morrison could get a headline over reduced petrol prices, he'll actually go for that, irrespective of how much damage it will cause to the budget or the economy or the environment. And what would be better would be halving the fares of public transport, similar to what New Zealand has recently done, or even make it free. These, of course, are state responsibilities, but it could be worked out through some sort of federal to state transfer, and that would probably be a better financial and public benefit. But that's definitely something that Morrison would never go for. Any policy, particularly before this election, is going to be based on not what is the greater good, but what will get us over the line. And the options are closing off for them as the pork barrel income through, the high prices are coming through, and basically Woolworths and Coles announced that um, because of the higher petrol prices, groceries are going to go up significantly in a week or so when the transport costs flow through to what's going on the shelves. At some point, incumbent governments are going to be blamed. Sometimes a federal government can hive that off to the states, but they won't be able to this time. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Up next... Are we being too harsh on politicians, or is it all just a part of the political process? Senator Kimberly Kitching died last week and we send our condolences to her family and friends. Members of Parliament don't die very often when they're still in office, but the grieving hadn't even started when the media started speculating that this was all caused by Labor Party pre-selection issues, and to me it just seemed a little bit disrespectful. Now, we don't really know what happened, so it's best not to comment, but politics is a difficult business. It's hard being a politician with all the different interest groups and stakeholders that either have to be balanced or appeased people that are going to be unhappy with the decisions that you make. And that's even before we get to the people within your own party making criticisms or wanting to actually have your position in Parliament. David, do you think that we're just a little bit too hard on politicians sometimes uh, or are the criticisms that they face from people like us, is that just a part of the job? It's part of the job. One of the things that I know we try and do is not to get too personal, that we try and look at facts and policies And of course, some of this is tied up together. To understand, for example, Scott Morrison's policies, you need to look at the personality to an extent. We don't know if Senator Kitching had underlying issues. We don't know if it was the stress, and we can never know. And even her husband, who was with her, and Bill Shorten drove out to be with them while they waited for the ambulance, which was a quite admirable thing. Speculation is rather pointless, and the coroner might be able to fill us in on some of it, but certainly not all of it. I know that the anti-vaxxers came out and pointed out that two people in their 50s, uh, Shane Warne being the other one, died in the same week and they'd been vaxxed or they'd had COVID or whatever it was. And this, to me, seemed to miss the point. People have heart attacks in their 50s all the time. It may have been related to their COVID. It may not have been. It certainly wasn't related to the vaccination, almost certainly not, unless there was an allergic reaction, something like that. When I criticise, I try to remember that there's a person behind this and what is fair to say and what is not fair to say. And I think that's all we can do. I think that it's really important to hold up 
policy and behaviour that affects public life to scrutiny. And if we stop that, we lose something very important in the democratic. But we can do that by not being unfair (laughs) and not being so harsh as to be meaningless. I didn't know Kimberly Kitching. I know that she was very well regarded. The Victorian Labor Party, too, are very close with each other, much more so than in other states, too. So it was a big blow for Victorian Labor, and I, they must be heartbroken down there. Well, it's actually quite morbid, the way that the media tried to weave in a narrative about the cause of death. The, the subtext was that the Labor Party is so terrible, look at what they do to their own people. And Bill Shorten was the one who gave a response to this idea of pre-selection pressure and the pressure of politics. But only after he was prompted quite a few times by Patricia Cavallis on the ABC to give an answer. But the media just cannot help themselves when it comes to speculating all sorts of things on the Labor side of politics. And a similar issue occurred when the Labor MP, Greg Wilton, he committed suicide in 2000. The media blamed pre-selection issues and the Labor Party for causing grief on a good family man, even though they'd never taken any interest in him beforehand. The Liberal Party MP, Don Randall, he died from a heart attack in 2015 in similar circumstances, but no one at the time talked about the stress of the job or any looming pre-selection issues, and his family's privacy was respected, and that's the way that it should be. No death in politics should be politicised, but there seems to be more of a habit in the media of somehow blaming the Labor Party when it does happen on their side. It's like only our side can organise, and... We've seen that the Liberal Party is devolving into uh, unmanageable rubble. We have one state branch that's been closed, a federal government that only has the attainment of power, another state branch that was pretty much electorally destroyed in Western Australia. And it looks like a similar thing's going to happen in South Australia as its Liberal Party gets caught out with more and more corruption and failures in governance. And it happens on both sides. Parties govern for so long, they run out of steam, they run run out of their good people. Lesser people get in or less experienced people, let's be fair, get in. And certainly criticise and examine and, and look at what's working, what's not working. But if you're going to, if you're a party and you're going to criticise the other party for being disorganised and badly run and check yourself. And the other thing too, the death of Randall, the death of Kimberly Kitching are equally tragic. Both people taken too young, both with futures that will never be realised. Well, Kimberly Kitching was an effective senator in Senate estimates committees holding the government to account. She was also instrumental in getting the Magnitsky legislation in Australia, and that's the legislation to implement sanctions against individuals involved in human rights abuses and corruption, and that law came into existence in December 2021. But you're absolutely right, a good senator has been taken away from us too soon. But my issue is that this focus on pre-selection issues within the Labor Party, it's taken the focus away from the biggest pre-selection issue in history, and the media and the Liberal Party is keen not to talk about it. you referred to this before. That's the dissolution of the New South Wales branch of the Liberal Party and the intervention by the federal Liberal branch. And you'd think, well, two months before a federal election, this is an issue which deserves more scrutiny. It's a temporary dissolution, but effectively Scott Morrison and Dominic Perrottet are the Liberal Party of New South Wales. And there were three sitting MPs, Susan Lay, Trent Zimmerman and Alex Hawke. They were facing a revolt from Liberal Party members who refused to endorse them for the federal election and wanted to hold a rank-and-file vote by the members. So this essentially means that they weren't going to be put up as candidates at the federal election. Morrison probably doesn't care too much about Susan Lay. Trent Zimmerman is probably going to lose his seat to an independent anyway. But it's Alex Hawke that Scott Morrison really wants to protect. He's a close ally of Morrison's. And like Morrison, he's part of the Pentecostal cult that has afflicted the Liberal Party and this government. So he, he'll do whatever he can to keep Alex Hawke in. Yeah, exactly. Zimmerman may have had a reprieve by Labor putting in an excellent candidate, which I think may affect the independent vote. And I said last time, the Labor candidate in North Sydney should have been pre-selected for Benelong next door. Who doesn't have a Labor candidate? And I'm not sure they've got a Liberal candidate yet because their local member, uh, John Alexander, is retiring. Nonetheless, Zimmerman is on the nose in North Sydney. 
Suzanne Lay has never really impressed as a minister or as a local member, apparently. And there's a cloud around Alex Hawke in terms of his honesty and probity and integrity. And of course, this is the one that Scott Morrison wants to protect. It must have been desperate for it to go to the Supreme Court during an election campaign. This is suicidal stuff during an election campaign. You'd hope that they'd be able to work it out between themselves. Oh, well, I guess that's why they've gone off to the Supreme Court. But For sure. I, that's what I'm saying. That, that It's children. And apparently the deep dislike that members of the federal Liberal Party have for the state Liberal Party is a factor in this too. And this is a really big issue. Like two months before a federal election, this should be the front page of the newspaper every day or the lead mm. story on a news website as well. And it just shows that even though the media is always keen to find fault within the Labor Party and promote the Liberal Party as a model of excellence, there are far more severe problems within the Liberal Party structures and within their factions. And this whole process, they're going off to the Supreme Court, the membership wanted a rank-and-file vote and they're not getting it. This affects the practicalities of the election as well. It affects the underground campaigning party members who are the lifeblood of the party and do things such as putting up campaigning material and posters and they're the ones that hand out the how-to-vote cards on election day they won't be so keen to do this in the election in new south wales and although we can say well COVID and postal voting might make all of this very different this year but not having enough people to manage the booths on election day can make a big difference i keep thinking of the warren mundane pre-selection in uh barrel and he gets parachuted in against the wishes of the local branch now on one level mundane was a national figure well known nationally he was a convert from the Labor Party, uh, which kind of helps. He's Indigenous and may have helped solve some of the at least image problems that the Liberal Party have with Indigenous affairs. And it was a swinging seat that was very winnable by the right candidate. They had selected a well-known local candidate who had a very good chance of winning the seat, apparently. And Mundine goes in, they lose half their volunteer army overnight, and those who remain aren't terribly enthusiastic nor motivated, and he loses the seat. If the local members don't want the candidate anymore, that's ultimately it. Whether that's fair or not is a whole different and unrelated issue. And, of course, Scott Morrison gets his pre-selection by branch stacking, but also by media help by destroying Michael Tuck's reputation. So he's clearly not above cheating and ignoring the membership. So it becomes problematic. This is the type of thing that may balance out my Zimmerman getting back in because if the local membership didn't want him, volunteer workers aren't necessarily going to use their extremely precious volunteering time to push for him. Same with Suzanne Lay and say with Hawke. If they were out to deselect them, no amount of orders from the Prime Minister is going to change the level of motivation for them. And speaking of electioneering and campaign posters, there's been a few issues with election advertising in Melbourne, and that's in the seats of Deakin and Goldstein. In Deakin, the Liberal Party MP, Michael Sukkar, he's been displaying election signage without the correct authorisation. And that's a requirement so that people who view that signage know the origins of that signage and which political party is behind it. Now, it's pretty obvious that a poster with Michael Sukkar's face on it is coming from the Liberal Party, but rules are rules, otherwise why have them in the first place? Complaints have been made to the Australian Electoral Commission and they guarantee that they'll reply within five working days and refer this to their authorisations team if necessary. But the Electoral Commission is just like any other bureaucracy, so it's slow to act, but nothing is likely to be done about this. And in the unlikely event that they will act, it's going to be far too late. So at the moment, it means that you can have unauthorised election signage. You can even have a poster which says that the correct way to vote is to vote one for the Liberal Party all made to look like an official Electoral Commission purple poster, which is exactly what the Liberal Party did in a few seats at the 2019 federal election and was adjudicated by a court that this was all above board. So by the time the Electoral Commission can act on any of these issues, the election will be well and truly over. And the finding will be irrelevant. Either they're in because it's unlikely they'll declare the seat vacant and go to a by-election, or they'll have lost and there'll be no... And partly it's because the AEC 
have had their budget cut and they've had further legislative restraints put on them. I don't want to be too hard on the individuals involved there. Tony Abbott appointed the commissioner, which may or may not be relevant, but it's it's worth noting the current commissioner was a Liberal Party employee. Having said that, the AEC has traditionally been one of the very best organisations of that type in the world, and it's terrible to see its teeth being blunted, particularly in the current climate. Oh, well, I'm pretty sure that 99.999% of votes that are cast are actually legitimately cast and counted, so I've got no issues about that. But it's the issues leading up to those votes being lodged in a ballot box that worry me. But over in the seat of Goldstein, the Liberal Party MP, Tim Wilson, he's gone to the Supreme Court. They're very happy to go to court, these Liberal Party people, but he's gone to the Supreme Court to have the election posters of the independent candidate, Zoe Daniel, taken down. The Bayside Council has a bylaw which stipulates that no election material can be displayed unless it's within a three-month period of an election. But Tim Wilson has argued that the election can be held as late as September this year, which is technically true, but close to impossible. And I've never seen Tim Wilson act so quickly. He didn't do anything at all on marriage equality laws. He hasn't acted at all on climate change. He hasn't acted at all on corruption in politics. He was active on the franking credits misinformation campaign during the 2019 federal election. But he has been one of the most ineffective local MPs ever in Australia's history. And there's actually been quite a few of those. But the most work that he's ever done is to try and stop his opponent from putting up election posters. Talk about getting your priorities all totally wrong. When you get to this stage, I think it shows that you you don't have much else. Tim Wilson seems to be one of those guys who gets well-paid, powerful jobs that he's never deserved. He was Freedom Commissioner, yeah, in which uh, he said that water cannons should have been opened on protesters. One of the things is that you may not agree with what I say to you, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. Voltaire never said that, by the way. That was put into a biography of Voltaire 100 years after he died. But the sentiment is correct. It's not about the idea. It's about your right to legally express that idea. And that's really important in a functioning democracy. Wilson only cared about marriage equality insofar it allowed him to marry his partner. He's been horribly transphobic since. And again, I don't want to bring into question the marrying of his partner. It was just that it was interesting that as it was something that directly affected him, he did a little bit for it. Not terribly much and not terribly effectively. And then used Parliament to propose to his partner, which may have been a nice symbolic gesture or may have just been more self-indulgence from a guy who's been promoted way beyond his abilities. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au. And you can now support New Politics through Patreon. There's a few other issues going on in politics as well. The federal government has imposed sanctions on Russian individuals, organisations and banks, and this is the correct course of action to take at this stage, but announcing what is actually happening is never enough for Scott Morrison. So he also ramped up his rhetoric, warned about an invasion of the region by Western forces. He also managed to weave China into the equation, and in case you're wondering, no, we're not going to have a war with China, but I'm half expecting that will be announced pretty soon. He also warned Australia will be the target of cyber warfare just to keep up the high level of anxiety on national security. And again, we're expected to believe that a federal government that sent one warship to Tonga and couldn't manage that properly, couldn't even manage a domestic crisis with floods and fires, is somehow going to defend Australia from the ravages of Russia and China. It's a tall order, of course. And this rhetoric on national security, it neatly flows into an announcement of $4.3 billion for a naval dry dock shipyard in Perth. And there's no prizes for guessing that this is an area that Scott Morrison needs to hold seats in if he wants to win the next election. But there's no support of policy based around this. What are these new naval ships going to be doing? Where will they be kept? What is their purpose? And how does it fit into Australia's military strategies on naval ships? 
It is something that will be supposedly commencing in two years' time and completed by 2030. That's eight years away. But as we saw with the cancellation of the French submarines late last year, things can easily be promised but never actually delivered. But in politics, if people believe something is going to happen as they lodge their ballot paper on election day, it's almost as good as it actually happening. They want to present themselves as tough and important. I don't think to the world, but to the Australian populace. We discussed last week how a lot of the places that these bases were announced didn't want the bases. And as the start date is things like 2030, eight years away, and it'll take three or four years for them to be established, a lot of the members of the the current government won't be around. They'll have moved on to other things, they'll have lost their seats, they'll have retired, whatever. A lot of the members of the opposition won't be around either. We might not even be around then. So it, it's pie-in-the-sky stuff that's easily dismissed, yet he's sticking with it. And again, this goes back to my point earlier in the podcast, where he will hold on to these ideas thinking that they're the only things that will work. This may be his fatal flaw. And there's also a state election in South Australia, and we think that the result there will give us a better idea of what might happen at the federal election. Scott Morrison hasn't appeared in the state election campaign or in any election material. So that gives us a good idea of what the South Australia Liberal Party thinks of their national counterparts. Now, they will all say state elections aren't affected by federal issues and vice versa. And they all know that that's not quite true. At John Howard's peak, he was in every state electoral campaign and he'd visit and he'd give the keynote speech and welcome the new supposed Premier and his photos would turn up here and there, and true with Labor too, Bob Hawke, Kevin Rudd. Where a leader is seen to be popular and a vote winner, they will be put in. And you could imagine that a man as addicted to promotion and self-publicity as Scott Morrison is, you could imagine that he would want to be part of the South Australian campaign, but he's not. And I think, yeah, that may say a lot about how he's looked at in South Australia. You're listening to New Politics. You can subscribe to us on Apple or Google Podcasts, listen through YouTube, SoundCloud and Amazon Music, or find us at newpolitics.com.au, and you can now support New Politics through Patreon. Up next, we speak to Sahar Khalili, the candidate for the Fusion Party in the Sydney seat of Reid. We've featured a few independent candidates and candidates from some of the smaller political parties over the past few months because we think democracy and politics should be available to everyone. And this week we look at the Fusion Party. As the name suggests, it's an amalgamation of several political parties and Saha Kalili is the candidate in the seat of Reid. That's in the inner western suburbs of Sydney. David Lewis caught up with her to find out more about the Fusion Party and her campaign in Reid. And thanks for joining us, Saha. Thank you for having me, David. Tell me about the Fusion Party. Where does it come from? Yeah, certainly. So um, Fusion Party is, is kind of a baby party at the moment, but also not because it has it's a formation of at least five um, very experienced parties. So we came about when um, the recent bill came through requesting that a party has a minimum of 1,500 members. So I was formerly part of the Science Party um, and I've been with them since 2020 and we felt confident for members but we just wanted to make sure that we are collaborating with aligned political parties and just make sure that we get over the line because I think it's really important to have diversity in um, availability of politicians and candidates when it comes to a healthy democracy. So we, we wanted to stay in the game. So we are joined up with the Pirate Party and Climate Emergency Party, Vote Planet and Secular Party, and recently with Climate Change Justice Party. So it's really so fascinating to just be in this group where people have come from different perspectives or different focus areas, but ultimately at our core we are very aligned because we really we recognise the value of using 
solid evidence for pushing our policies and we care about just holistic well-being and health of the community and the people in the community. So we care about better health for people. We care about health of the environment. The pirates, they care about freedom of the individual um, and free access to culture, which just really helps nourish a community and hold it together. So I feel like it's been a really enriching experiment having all of these parties come together to form Fusion. Um, And as well, it means that we have a lot more of a network behind us. We have uh, a lot more experience and expertise to really fuel the minutia of our policies. So very excited. So what are the policies of the Fusion Party? Um, So we have a, a collection of core policies. The first primary one is climate emergency, recognizing the climate emergency we're in now and setting up structures so that we can address that. And I think what it really requires is we need to move out of the the current operations that we have and just to move into more of a disaster approach. So disaster um, operations to address climate emergency. Other things we have are the universal basic income idea. So this is just allowing for um, unconditional welfare for all Australians. So the benefit of that is, um, you know, there's a lot of evidence behind it if you need convincing. There's things like the polyvagal theory. So when people are taken out of a stressful mindset, if they're stressed about, you know, paying rent and, and getting food and just the very basics you need to be a healthy person, then you don't have capacity, mental capacity to be um, progressive or to take make healthy decisions in your life to even go out and find work. So it, it creates a mental health impact as well. So because we care about universal access to healthcare, we also want to have uh, a basic universal income. And just to give people that, that little help they need to have that mental health, the help they need to just to give them the ability to be able to go out and participate as a healthy member of the community. One of our other uh, major policies is um, about transparency of government. So I think my experience with government and public service uh, and just general politicians is it, it feels like they are not visible or they're not present to the public. And I think since they are meant to be there serving our best interests, we really need to have more transparency and visibility of current government processes Uh, more visibility and access to how decisions are made and the reasons behind them, um, and just a lot more opportunity for involvement in decision-making. Another personal project I have is to increase education and awareness on just basic Australian politics and civics. So I think, you know, I'm in my 30s. I haven't encountered any type of education just to understand the very basics of how voting works and and how the the ministers get in and and what they do and how to access them. I mean, none of that has been available. And so that creates a barrier for people to be able to engage in politics. Um, The other day I went out to the public and I was um, just speaking to people in my electorate just to understand how they feel about the election coming up and what their priorities are and how they decide who they want to vote for. And um, overwhelmingly, it was reassuring to hear that people are a little bit disillusioned by the major parties and they're looking for someone more independent and they were looking for more integrity, more transparency. And this is something I really strongly stand for and what Fusion stands for. So uh, just to spruik myself a little bit, I guess what I'm getting at is I want to implement processes in government that make it a lot more efficient and allow for more communication and transparency because this is similar to what I do at work anyway. And I think if we do that, we'll have a more healthy democracy and we'll have better decisions that suit everyone. Fusion really wants to just allow more diversity in the conversation in Parliament. So we have a lot of expertise behind us and some really strong values that resonate with the communities around us, which, you know, includes more innovation, more transparency, more communication. I mean, I think what's been happening over the past nine years just really hasn't been to the benefit for lifting Australia into being a big player, like internally and externally. Our internet isn't great. Medicare keeps getting cuts 
at it. Poverty is increasing since before pandemic levels. So we're aware that we will not likely form government in this election, but what Fusion offers is accessibility for the public to collaborate with us and to be a voice for them in Parliament. How many seats are you running in? At the moment, we have candidates in Western Australia, Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia. Um, I think all up, I'm going to say 10, but it may increase. Now, it's a, a, well, a fusion of four smaller parties, science, where you come from, the secular party, the pirate party and climate emergency. You've got to have differences. How are you resolving those? Or have they not come up? Are they so small that they haven't come up? Or are we looking at a split down the line somewhere? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. And it has come up. Um, So a lot of our values are aligned. But there is one that has come up. And that's the question about nuclear power. So of course, the climate change parties that have joined us are traditionally against nuclear power. And Science Party was for nuclear power. So we've had many collaborative meetings together, you know, so it's really good. We're quite fast at iterating our policies and coming to decisions that way. But with nuclear power, after so many meetings and and discussions, very passionate ones, what we've come to is we agree that we want to remove the ban on nuclear power being available or or being uh, approached in Australia. At the moment, there is a ban so that we're we're just not able to approach it, uh, which is a problem because we really need those resources for nuclear medicine. It's it's quite important. And I think having an outright ban is not really uh, fruitful. You know, we need to have that ability to do some more research just to see how we can um, approach nuclear power if we wish, but just to outright being able to even think about it is is not good. So we've come to that compromise. And also, I mean, within our party, we have the freedom to refer to our policies and then also have our own personal Uh, opinion on that as well. So why did you decide to run as a candidate as opposed to working behind the scenes in the party? Yeah, well, I was enthused to join a party ever since the um, complete apparent disengagement that came from our leader during the 2019 bushfires. So I saw the ash and the debris floating through the sky as I was just walking home from work. I'd see it and that would make me think, wow, that was someone's house or someone's photo album. And just seeing that non-urgency from ScoMo not coming back from holiday, that made me realise politics was in a bad state. So I did some Googling, searched federal ICAC, and I came across the Science Party and I read their policies and their approach and I thought, this is great. This is what I stand by. And the Science Party had a lot of uh, great detailed policies and a lot of information there, but I felt like they weren't getting the engagement that they need with the public. I felt like they were just sitting there on a gold mine, but nobody knew about them or not enough people. So that's why I'm getting involved because I feel I have the confidence to communicate effectively and also just speak to the public. I've done a lot of public speaking and have liked the idea of being that front of shop spruker with the microphone just talking about all the all the deals so that's why I'm involved because uh, I think the real value is in collaborating and sharing with people and sharing information and I think having barriers is where we have that confusion we have that conflict we have that inefficiency and that's why I'm running because I feel I have those skills to implement what I want to see. What is it that you bring to the seat of Reed? Well, I've been living in Reed for five years now. I'm a big fan of the Bay Run and I, I really just, I live here. I engage with uh, what we have around here and, uh, and I'm quite engaged with what the council is doing. So I listen into the council meetings and I see what they are doing locally and I see that they have requests for more funding from the state member and the federal member. And I notice that the mayor of Canada Bay is a Labour Party representative, whereas state and federal, we have Liberal Party members. And I realise that there may be a bit of a barrier or difficulty for them to have funding given to them for just the local activities they do for the community here. Because I believe in collaboration and communication and transparency, if I become the seat holder for Reed, I will definitely be supporting and implementing communication channels between federal and council and state. 
I have a lot of state interests as well. So um, I come from a health background. I uh, used to be a pharmacist and then I was actively involved in the COVID response team at the Ministry of Health or New South Wales Health over 2020 and 21. And I have interests there. So I want to be able to facilitate adequate funding to come from the federal piggy bank to go to what we need locally at state and local levels. So for our listeners outside of Reed, what is it you'd bring to the federal parliament? Well, I'm not a career politician, so I I think I would bring that freshness. I'm also quite assertive, so I feel comfortable just requesting what I need or calling out things where there are gaps in a cooperative way. I think in Parliament, I'll be able to really be able to be specific in what needs to happen for things to be effective and just to call out things that aren't happening. So I have a lot of experience in um, change and transformation projects, especially within um, the public services. I've been working a lot in public health departments and federal services because I, I feel very confident in those skills. Those skills are highly transferable to Parliament. And I think Parliament needs a little bit of a shake-up. It's become too comfortable and complacent in sitting in its big jargon words that really just block a lot of uh, public interest and interaction. And so I will be just clearing that out and making it easier for people to have more engagement and awareness of what's going on federally. Uh, Is there anything else you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks. Um, I think uh, you'll be seeing my face whether I get elected into Reed or not. I'm really passionate about creating more awareness and education to empower people and the community. And the first things I'll be delivering would be uh, just some educational videos and materials on the basics of civics and voting. I think it's really important for people to know that. And just to have that awareness that your vote really does count and it's really seen and It does make a difference. People see where your interests are. And then if government doesn't take notice of that, then there's a problem there. But I really want people to feel reassured that getting informed and making decisions on their vote really uh, sends a message. That was Saha Kilili from the Fusion Party, and she's running for office in the seat of Reid. You can find out more details about her campaign at fusionparty.org.au. That's it for this episode of New Politics. Thanks for listening in. If you'd like to support our style of journalism and commentary, please make a donation at our website at newpolitics.com.au. We don't beg, plead, beseech or gaslight you about journalism coming to an end. We just keep it very simple. If you like what we do, please send some support our way. It keeps our commitment to independent journalism ticking along. I'm Eddie Djokovic. Thanks for listening in and it's goodbye to our listeners. I'm David Lewis. We'll see you next time.